Anybody else? Any other prayer requests? I don't know if Susan's having technical difficulty or what. She's she's supposed to be here. I know Barbara's online, but she can't respond. Lloyd, where's the rest of your crew? Barbie's uh, coming over right now. She's putting uh, Lauren on the back of a uh, looks like a Tennessee Walker. She's, she had to put um, she had to put Charlie on the back of a horse. So Charlie's riding horse while we're while we're at church. Uh, <coughs> Lauren, Lloyd's uh, youngest daughter. Yeah, well, not really, but uh, she had her wisdom teeth that removed Friday, so we need to remember her. I'm sure, she's imitating a chipmunk right now, but uh, uh, hope she gets well quick. Thank you. That's correct. All right. Any other prayer requests? Are they the only ones that can hear me if we pray here? Are Zoomers the only ones that can hear? Am I the only one that Zoomers can hear if we have prayer? Okay. All right, let's pray. We have some issues, um, but it's all in the effort to come and listen to your word and hear you speak to us through it. We know that you control everything. We know that what happens in this world or what happens to us as individuals is controlled by you. This last week, Lord, Susan reminded me of something when she said that uh, you are with us even in the most mundane things, just like going to Walmart. You're there to protect us, to keep us safe, to watch over us. Just that small thing. Sometimes there's greater things that come around, like what's going on in our country now, but there's greater things in our individuals, individual lives. And Lord, we know that today Reino needs you to bless him, to give him hope, to help his brother. We've been there, Lord, all of us. And we know what that's like. So we should share with him in that troubled time. We know, Lord, that it's continued that our church is struggling we're struggling to get through these times but we need to call on you we need to be with you we need to have you in our hearts and minds that's the most important thing if anything in this world is essential lord it's that we have a relationship with you we know our creator we know our destination and we know our hope in getting there. Thank you again, Lord, for everything that you do for us. For all those that have brought prayer requests verbally. And for all those who have secretly in their hearts cried out to you. We ask that you be with us today, Lord, as we share your word. Help us to understand clearly and to be able to see what we see. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Where's your mask? <laughs> okay. 
If everybody can hear me and everybody can see me, and you don't have to really see me, if you can just hear me, then th we're going to talk about something today I wrote on the board. Do you see what you see? To start out with, uh, I don't like to use myself as a personal example of anything, but today I'm going to make an exception. In 1957, I was about 10 years old, and I was in Carlisle, Kentucky, visiting my grandparents. And across from their house was a theater. Next to it was Mather's Funeral Home. And this theater was pretty interesting. I, when I'd go down there, they let me go to the theater because they could watch me walk over, go in, and then they watched me come back out from their front porch. So it was just across the street. And I thought that was a big deal at 10 years old that I could go to the theater by myself, eat popcorn, and watch a movie. At this particular time, the movie that I went to see was called The Ten Commandments. This is a pretty interesting movie. You remember it, I'm sure. Charlton Heston, Yul Brenner, Ann Baxter, Yvonne DiCarlo, Edward G. Robinson. It was in really good color for then. This movie made by Cecil, Cecil B. DeMille actually was way ahead of its time. The initial release of this movie in 1956 was grossed $122 million. Think of what that would be in these times that that would gross. But let me tell you something else. You know, they won an Academy Award for Best Events actual events in the movie, best effects. They won an Academy Award for best actor. This movie was four hours long. At the movie theater where I went, it had a matinee. And the matinee, that matinee started at about four o'clock. So, it went from four to eight. While I was there that weekend, I saw it twice. Eight hours worth of movie. It, had, it has today the Ten Commandments, and there's remakes of it, but it, the original has today a 4.8 rating on the Internet for a movie. That's pretty significant. Again, it was quite something for me to be able to do that, and I remember it well. DeMille tried to <clears throat> do in motion pictures what artists attempt to do for centuries on canvas. Capture this moment. It is an ancient writer of the book of Exodus who reports and describes the moment for us. And the children of Israel in prayers and song for centuries afterwards remember the moment. And the God who brought it all to pass. It is an ancient writer of that book the, of the Hebrew people they were newly freed. Last week we talked about Moses and the burning bush. Well, they went through all this slavery, and they are free. And they begin this journey, because what did it, what did God promise Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? He promised them to go to the promised land. He was going to give them this land. So they pull them out of Egypt 
and they take off on the journey. You know, you if you look at a map, that journey, Egypt's over here, and it kind of goes up northeast to get to Canaan. But that's not the way they went. The Hebrew people, if they would have charted their own course, would have taken that route. Their logical choice would have been to go the shortest way, which that between two points. But they didn't. The, the, the people were not charting their own course. God was charting their course for this journey, guiding them daily with a massive cloud in front of them. Now, you're talking about a million and a half people following this big cloud in front of them. So he was guiding them with this cloud. At night, that cloud turned into fire. So they could actually travel at night because they had light and they could see their way. It must have, must have been a great comfort to Moses and the people, this visible phenomenon that accompanied and led them along the way. Perhaps there was times in, there's times in our lives, too, that God gives us guidance and it's not obvious to us. Not as obvious as a big cloud during the day leading you or a big light at night leading you. While their destination was to the northeast, God began leading them south and southeast. He made an appointment to meet them at Mount Sinai which was the southern part of the Sinai Peninsula. And he also, he knew that the more direct route up to Canaan would have caused them to run into people that didn't like them very well, and they would have to fight battles. And so he took them down and around, and for other reasons as well. Also, although God had taken his chosen people out of Egypt, he hadn't taken Egypt out of the people yet. God had to teach the people. He had to, the Hebrews didn't have the Bible. Okay. We'll get it straight here. Don't get up again, Bob. <laughs> the decision to head south soon appeared to be a strategic mistake, at least from human eyes. The Egyptian pharaoh, for whom surrender was a momentary exception rather than rule, had reconsidered his decision to let the slaves go. And so, with an army of chariots in his wake, the Pharaoh set off in hot pursuit of the Hebrews. When he caught up with them, he found them camped on the shores of the Red Sea. The Israelites seemed to be trapped. On one side was a dominating military force mustered by, by, a king, by the king of Egypt. On the other side was a substantial body of water and caught in the middle were the children of Israel whose recent feeling of deliverance and victory suddenly turned into despair. If God had led them by a more direct, direct route, they would have not encountered the Red Sea, and they would have been, not been trapped. In Cecil's movie, DeMille says the Pharaoh sees this situation and observes the God of Moses. And he says, this God of Moses must be a poor general to leave no retreat. Retreat, however, is a relative thing. What looked like no escape to Pharaoh and to the panicking Hebrews, for that matter, was no problem for God. For the Lord did not intend for his people to retreat, 
but to new, move forward. The massive pillar of in front of them, which had been exclusively in, in, in that position to lead the Israelites until this moment, reversed and went around and stood behind them. Meanwhile, back at the beach, the Lord sent a strong east wind to blow across the waters of the Red Sea. All night long, the wind blew, and it blew with such force and effect that it created a path of dry ground. In the midst of what had been a sea, the people could walk across to the other side. Now, I'm describing to you Cecil B. DeMille's Ten Commandments that I saw in 1957, twice. So at some point, I'm going to switch and I'm going to describe it from the Bible. But the idea is, do you see what you see? Every portrayal of this event is abbreviated in the movie. A portrait can only be a snapshot. A movie scene can only be for a few minutes long. But this was an event that lasted all night. And it must have been a sight to behold. So let's look at the scripture and see what it says. Then the Lord said to Moses, tell the Israelites to turn back and to encamp near the Red Sea. And they, were, they are encamped by the sea directly opposite of Baal Zephon. And God said, Pharaoh will think the Israelites are wandering around in the land in confusion, hemmed in by the desert. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart and he will pursue them. But I will gain glory for myself through Pharaoh and his army, and the Egyptians will know that I am Lord. So the Israelites did that. They camped by the sea. When the king of Egypt was told the people had fled, Pharaoh and his officials changed their minds about them and said, What in the world have we done? We have let the Israelites go and lost our ser their services. So he had his chariot made ready and took his army with him. He took 600 of the best chariots along with other chariots of Egypt and officers over all of them. The Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, so that he pursued the Israelites who were marching out boldly. He had to stop them. The Egyptians, all of Pharaoh's horses and chariots, horsemen and troops pursued the Israelites, overtook them as they camped by the sea opposite Baal Zephon. As Pharaoh approached, the Israelites looked up, and there were the Egyptians marching after them. They were terrified, and they cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, Was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us to the desert to die? What have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt? Didn't we say to you in Egypt, leave us alone, let us serve the Egyptians. It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians to die in the desert. These are the same people who stood before Pontius Pilate and yelled, crucify him. So Moses answers the people, do not be afraid. Stand firm, and you will see the deliverance of the Lord, and it will be brought today. The Egyptians you see today, will, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. The Lord said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Why are you whining? Look what I've done, and you're whining about it? Tell the Israelites to move on. Raise your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea. Divide the water that the Israelites can go through the sea on dry ground. I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they will come after you. And I will gain glory through Pharaoh and his army, through his chariots and his horsemen. The Egyptians will know that I am the Lord when I gain glory through Pharaoh, his chariots and horsemen. In scripture, here we go. And this is what we're looking for. 
a Christophany. The angel of God who had been traveling in front of Israel's army withdrew and went behind them. Let's say that again. The angel of God who had been traveling in front of Israel's army withdrew and went behind them. Chapter 14 of Exodus. This is what I'm reading. The clouds out here in front of the Israelites. The Egyptians are coming. The cloud goes around and stands between the Egyptians and the Israelites. That side of the cloud was darkness. The Israelites couldn't see, or the Egyptians couldn't see where they were going. So they had to stay there. At the same time, the pillar of fire that's on the front is showing the light across the sea. Moses takes his staff and, and points it toward the sea, and it opens up. Throughout the night, the cloud brought darkness to one side and light to the other side, so neither went near the other all night long. When Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and all that night the Lord drove the sea back with a strong east wind and turned it into dry land. The waters were divided. The Israelites went through the sea on dry ground with a wall of water on their right and a wall of water on their left. The Egyptians pursued them. And Pharaoh's horses and chariots and horsemen followed them into the sea. During the last watch of the night, the Bible tells us, Jesus looked down from the pillar of fire and cloud at the Egyptian army and threw it into confusion. He jammed the wheels of their chariots so that they had difficulty driving. And the Egyptians said, let's get out of here. <laughs> let's get away from the Israelites. The Lord is fighting for them against Egypt. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea so the waters may flow back over the Egyptians and their chariots and their horsemen. And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. At daybreak, the sea went back in its place. The Egyptians were fleeing toward it. And the Lord swept them into the sea. And the water flowed back and covered the chariots and horsemen. The entire army of Pharaoh had, that had followed the Israelites into the sea, not one of them survived. But the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground with a water wall on their right and their left, that the day of the Lord saved Israel from the hands of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians lying dead on the shore. And when the Israelites saw the mighty hand of the Lord displayed against the Egyptians, the people feared the Lord and put their trust in him and in Moses, his servant. quite a story don't you believe that god could have provided an instantaneous way to defeat the egyptians or to deliver the israelites he could have just said let there be he did it when he created the world he just said let there be light then he certainly did not need the entire night to part the Red Sea. Yet rather than a miracle in a moment, he chose a process that took all night. Perhaps there was some mercy in that. For it afforded the Egyptians plenty of opportunity to recalculate and retreat. They did not. But then their king was stubborn and proud. And those two traits seldom recalculate, seldom retreat. You see, skeptics have long been uneasy with this miraculous account. The parting of the Red Sea seems on its face so improbable 
to them that they search for alternative explanations. Of course, finding an alternative explanation does not by itself rule out the hand of God or the purpose of God. The Ten Commandments, the movie, the Pharaoh tries to find all alternative explanations for the plagues that had beset his land. He said, when the, when the Nile ran red, I too was afraid. But then he admits to Moses, until word came, a mountain beyond the cataracts, which spewed red mud and poison into the water. You think this is just ancient time stuff? It hasn't been too long ago that I watched this on TV, that they declared that a volcano in Italy erupted at this time and took this huge cloud of poisonous gas over the Nile and killed all of these fish crocodiles, whatever was in the water. So that was an explanation of getting away of what God said happened. Pharaoh said, was it a wonder your God, that your God that would create fish to die and frogs should leave the waters? What miracle is it that flies and lice should bloat upon the bodies and spread disease to both man and beast? These things were ordered by themselves, Pharaoh said, and not by God. The skeptic believes that if events can be explained by nature, then they are natural, not supernatural. Meanwhile, if the events seem to contravene nature and its laws, then the report of those events must be fabricated and exaggerated. Belief came late to the skeptical Egyptians. Too late. After the Lord had blown a dry path for the Israelites, they began their journey on the other side. Meanwhile, after giving his own people a a good head start, Jesus must have removed the barrier from in front of those Egyptians. He gave them a chance, and he moved it. For a while, they were kept away from the Israelites through the night while the wind blew. Pharaoh's chariots were suddenly free to pursue the Israelites down into the dry Red Sea. Then the Bible reports that Jesus threw the Egyptian army into panic and clogged their chariot wheels so they, they wouldn't turn. At that late moment, the doomed enemies of God finally came to a great realization. Let us get out of here. God's fighting for them. Surely, this is among the most slow-witted statements of all history. Let us get out of here. Egypt had suffered all these plagues. It had been decimated. And each time it was predicted by God's man, Moses, that same God had sent darkness on the land, which distinguished between the Egyptians and the Israelites for three days. He had sent pestilence that killed Egyptian animals, but spared animals of the Israelites. And then in the final lethal blow, that same God had caused death of the firstborn of every Egyptian household, while the Hebrew homes were passed over. Then, some few days later, at the site of the Red Sea, that God created a barrier to protect his children. And then, in the meantime, he parted a body of water so that those people, his people, could cross over to the other side. After all of that, and I've repeated it now both the movie way and the Bible way. After all that, when the chariot wheels wouldn't turn anymore, their fate was sealed. It finally dawned on the Egyptians. Huh. God must be fighting for them. 
the question to the Egyptians would be, well, that's good. What gave you the first clue? Was it the pestilence? Was it all these miracles and acts? Jonathan, Jonathan Swift wrote, there's none so blind as they that won't see. Pharaoh and his cohorts would not see. Miracle after miracle, they just would not see it. Or at least they did not recognize and understand what they were seeing. They're not alone. Some of those who witnessed the day of Pentecost event in Jerusalem saw the Spirit manifest and move in unprecedented ways. Yet what did they chalk it up to? These guys are drunk. A little too much wine. Acts 2, 12, 13. Some who watched Christ himself going about doing good reckoned it was the work of Baal Elzebub. Luke 11, 15. So very often people see God at work without recognizing it. Recognizing him. But where the magicians saw magic, where Pharaoh saw nature, where the skeptic sees exaggeration, Moses and the Israelites saw the hand of God. They all looked at the same things, but they did not see the same things. I want to show you something. I think Bob would try to hold it up for the Zoomers, and I'll hold it up for you. See if I can get it around. Okay. On here is if you take these groups of words like NST, UAV, does that make a word? Or can you put this in front of it and make a word? Is there a word on here? Anybody see a word? You recognize the word? Do you recognize it, Buzz? <laughs> you see, the reason is that you're seeing the same thing that the Zoomers are seeing and that I'm seeing, but you don't recognize the word. If you put Two of these together, do they make a word? You're seeing it. But the reason you're seeing it is you don't have the knowledge of what it takes. Because the word is Tielmo. Hold up Tielmo, Bob. There you go. Tielmo. What does that mean? Well, if you knew Latin, if you knew Latin, you knew you know what that word means. The Almo. That's in Spanish using Latin. Somebody's got their microphone on. It's me. I'm trying I gotta show the people the big screen. <laughs> but in in Italian, it's T I. It's a to me a Tielmo. Hey, don't you see it's a Tielmo. Tielmo. If you watch some movies, you've seen it, especially ones that speak Italian. But it means to love. Now all of us saw this. All of us saw it. But because we didn't have the knowledge of Latin or Spanish or Italian. We couldn't recognize it, could we? Te amo, to love. You see, you can see something, but unless you have the knowledge to see it, you don't know what it is. You can only see what you know. But you don't always know what you see. 
If you know Latin, you see it. But if you don't know Latin, then you don't know what you're looking at. It's still there. It's not like it's not there. The word's there. But you don't recognize it because you don't know it. Likewise, for us humans, for Pharaoh and Moses, for the skeptics and the believers, the man or woman of God looks at circumstances and events and they recognize the hand of God there. The person who does not know God, however, doesn't see him. Even though he's there. A couple of weeks ago, we talked about the possibility of God being in orchestrating current events or at least allowing for certain consequences for our prior choices to run their course and do their correcting work. But in an individ individual life or in our country as a whole, let me say that again. We talked about God allowing for certain consequences for our prior choices to run its course and to do their correcting work both as individuals and for our country. Perhaps if you were standing at the bottom of the Red Sea looking up, at the two walls of water, hundreds of feet high, would you recognize that God was orchestrating the events that you and a bunch of Hebrews and Egyptians were participating in? Would you recognize it? However, if you go home today, you go home from here and you turn on your TV and you see coverage of riots that have gone on in Portland, New York, Chicago, and many other cities across the nation, would you be able to recognize God's plan and what you see? Would you be among those who cry out, save us, Lord, save us? or among those who cry out, crucify him. Pharaoh and the Egyptian army saw God in the events, but it's too late. Moses and the Hebrews saw the same as the Egyptians saw, and the result turned out to be a mountaintop spiritual high on the eastern shores of the Red Sea. Although it was short-lived. Jesus was there protecting the Hebrews. Same Jesus that walked the road to Emmaus and told those guys that he was there. But see, even though Jesus was there protecting, they didn't understand. They didn't understand that Jesus moved the dark side of the cloud that led. They only know that the dark side of the cloud that led was now behind them, protecting them from the Egyptians. They didn't know that Jesus moved the far east side out into the front so they could see how to walk across the dry land. They only knew that it was light and they could go through this tunnel of water. You can only see what you know. Knowledge of God is the wisdom to know what you see. You can only see what you know. Knowledge of God is the wisdom to know what you see. Now all God's people said. Amen. <laughs> Amen.
know one thing, I watch you all with the mask on here, and it, and it makes you look sleepy. You look like <laughs> you sat there breathing your own breath for a while. I look about ready to fall asleep. But we're not getting up oxygen. <laughs> That's right. That's a good lesson to think about this week. Yep. Trying to see God's hand in what we're doing, what's happening in our world is exactly. difficult. And it's only difficult because we don't know God. Exactly. That's right. That's it. Got it. Okay. Have a great Sunday. Bye. Have a good week. Bye, Bye everyone. Bye bye. Everybody on camera here. Help if I turn the camera straight. Good social distancing, guys. Clean up crews on the way. <laughs>